It's an evolution, just like when two actors act out a scene on stage, only our process is just drawn out a little longer. It's kind of challenging to make these things talk and sing. We're not performing monkeys, Dave. I never thought I would have to act with couches and coffee tables and floors. Toaster waffles. Not just for breakfast anymore, eh, guys? The real challenge is to kind of see it before it happens. Hey! The biggest challenge, without question, is acting with nothing. You know what, why don't you guys go and play or raid the dessert table or something? Very subtle, Dave. So what I've had to do is kind of imagine them in my head as I'm acting with pieces of tape on the floor that say A, T, and S. I'll get to rehearse and do one stuffy pass, as we call it, with stuffed animals to know where the eye lines are gonna be so that the effects guys know where the chipmunks are moving and how they're moving, where they're going. But then when we're done with the stuffy pass, I have to remember where they're hopping, in what order. Alvin goes this way, Simon goes that way, Theodore stays there. So I have to find those eyelines. Hey, duh, but. And so I'm ultimately talking to a planter and a bush and post. No offense, big guy, <laughs> but you are not good at this. These are three distinct, different little brothers who are going to be acting differently, they're acting according to their personalities, they move differently, and you have to take that all into account as best you can. Amazing on the Invisimon. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> all right, good. Let's do one more. These are real chipmunks in the sense that they have real chipmunk skeletons inside their body. They'll climb trees like chipmunks. We put them in chipmunk poses wherever possible. Stupid! Stupid! Whoa. What's happening? But, they're real, they're affected by gravity just like you and I are, so that gives you one way to ground the characters. The size proportions on the characters uh, are, are much larger than real chipmunks. Real chipmunks are maybe about four or five inches long max. Theo, who's our smallest chipmunk, is about six and a half inches tall, and our tallest chipmunk is Simon, who's around ten and a half inches tall. So they're much larger than normal chipmunks, which allows them to read better on film, so you can believe them as characters and actually believe them emoting with uh, Jason Lee. You guys can sing too? That's not singing. This is singing. <laughs> The more upright they are in walking biped, the less you believe them as chipmunks. So a lot of effort was made to keep them as quadrupeds most of the time. Whoa. <laughs> there you go. Thank you. In the middle of the conversation, they'll stop to just you know real fast. Then they'll just go right back into it, not even aware that they did that. One of the challenges you come across is when you create a design of these characters, it works really well in 2D in the design land. But once you start moving these things around and have them perform, you actually have to have an anatomy that you define. It's not a real anatomy, but it is anatomy that you have to define and adhere to. So it's much more cartoony, it may have much more of an exaggerated performance, but there are certain rules you have to set up for yourself and you can't violate those rules or else you won't buy them as an actual performer. But you can go much further than an actual live action actor would. Hello. Gorgeous. We try to think of what would happen if there's a human brain inside a chipmunk body. Because they still have chipmunk bodies, chipmunk hands. I mean, we made, maybe made the fingers a little more human, but you know, chipmunks have very human-esque fingers as well. So we use that to guide their performance. They can't do anything a real chipmunk can't do, but they can do things that a super intelligent chipmunk could do. Toothbrush, huh? Okay. You keep layering it. Start with boarding, then the actors do something that you didn't expect, and then we do something with the crew here at Rhythm and Hughes. Because all these animators, they're performers, they're actors, they just work behind a computer monitor. They'll cue off something that maybe I didn't see or Tim didn't see in the live actor's performance, and they'll bring something new to the character. There's a real camaraderie that I guess that, that gets built up between the, the special effects crew and the visual effects crew, because we have to create what is essentially this invisible handshake that's going to happen later on. There's a really good example of a shot in the big venue where they're all starting to go crazy and they're no longer lip-syncing. 
and they're kind of sabotaging the, the whole event. And Simon jumps up on the keyboard, and he's up there doing the little river dance. And the special effects crew, really quickly, they tore apart the keyboard for us. They ripped you know, wires out of it. They made a big special panel with wood and full set of keyboards on, with just copper wiring. And then they wired some gloves with little copper tips on all the fingertips with wires running out of the back. And if you touched this little keyboard that would sit off screen, the keys on the actual keyboard would play. And then later on, we go ahead and we put in Simon wherever those keys were going up and down. Now, performance-wise, once we got to some of these big numbers, like Witch Doctor, we had terrific choreography, and we had three dancers actually perform the chipmunk dance on screen. There was one who was Simon, one who was Theodore, and one who was Alvin. And in the beginning, I thought that would be a relatively straightforward copy for the animators to look at what the real performers did, real dancers did, and just copy it. But when it came time to the performance, you know, Alvin, it's going to be a little more chest up because he's finally getting what he believes he deserves his whole life, you know, his spot in the sun. Theo, they made just wide-eyed. And even though he was dancing and keeping up with everybody else, he just couldn't believe he was where he was. And then Simon, you know, he just seemed like he's very confidently dancing and very self-assured. So in terms of a character having a believable singing performance, one of the things we try to do is put in a musculature so that every movement that they make uh, actually feels driven by muscle. So as they sing, as they make oohs and ahs, you want to see their face react to that motion accurately so that you believe it is an actual performance. There's controls on the muscle to do that stuff, you know, to make the nose twitch. There's controls on the upper and lower lips to really push certain smiles and expressions around. There's controls on the eyes, you know, to get a sneer and to get an angry look and a, a sly look, um, a cool look, a funny look, a scared look, everything, excited, all the whole shebang. Mm -hmm. Clearly an animator can make a character live without benefit of a vocal performance. The best animated films, you believe they're alive. You don't say, wow, look at this cool technical thing I'm watching, or look at those drawings move. But a voice informs the performance. There's a rhythm and an acting there that, as animators and performers, we're trying to bring to the screen. Yeah, you're our only friend. For these chipmunks, we're all furred characters, and that's something that Rhythm and Hughes really hangs its hat on, is our ability to do fur. We feel we have some of the nicest fur in the uh, visual effects industry. Each character has millions of strands of hair on them, the densest of which is Theo. There are almost as many hairs on that chipmunk as there are on a real chipmunk. The reason for that is because he's supposed to be younger, a little softer, so we actually had to up the number of hairs on him and then lower the opacity on it so that it's a little softer feel so that he feels more like the baby of the group. This is absurd. I feel like P. Diddy with fur. It's been a lot of fun, really, working on this movie. It's, it's, a, it's a really good project, and it, it's a funny film. Going into this, I thought, gosh, I remember the chipmunks from when I was growing up. And is it really going to work, putting them into a live action movie? And, I, you know, it'll be, it'll be interesting. It'll be a fun little project. And I was totally won over. You know, I got attached to them. <laughs> Peace, we out. Bye, Uncle Ian. Merry Christmas. Now it really is Christmas. Whoa! Mayday, mayday! Whoa! Whoa! Allow us to introduce ourselves. Hello, uh, I'm Simon. The the smart one, he's Alvin, the awesomest one, and I'm Theodore. Well, my dad, first of all, had an amazing sense of humor, number one. Number two, he started as a songwriter. First song he ever wrote, Come On To My House, for Rosemary Clooney. Before that, he had about 60 acres in Fresno, raising grapes. The business was terrible, and my, my mom and dad said, the music business can't be any tougher than grapes and raisins. Let's at least follow our dream. So my dad took the family, moved to L.A., 1950, with the one song he had written, Come On To My House. Huge hit, and he's thinking, this is the life. Grapes and raisins are way tougher than the music business. Well, of course, after that, few dry years. So it's now 1958, my dad's got $200 left in the bank and is crazy enough to take the $200 and buys the state-of-the-art tape recorder that allows him to change speeds. Now I'll rehearse the boys of the tape. 
This is the tape recorder, and, and what it was able to do that none of the other things could do back in those days is actually switch speeds. You could actually change the speed so that then my dad spoke like that into this handy dandy microphone. Hey, that sounds fine. And he writes Witch Doctor. He had sped up the sound of a piano before, and he loved what that did, and he thought, I wonder what that would do to a voice. <laughs> Of course, that became really the kind of the genesis of what would be this, the chipmunk sound about six months later. Witch Doctor comes out, it's a huge hit. I love it because we get to get a swimming pool. A couple of months later, the record company comes to my dad and said, you know, we'd love another one of those novelty things, one of those fun, everyone wants to buy it kind of songs. Could you do another one of those? So my dad had played around with the chipmunk of, you know, vocal of the witch doctor and said, okay, I just want to give it more personality. What, what could they be, you know, singing reindeer, alligator, hippopotami, what? And he was driving around in Yosemite about July of 1958 thinking, reindeer, grasshoppers, what? And this little tiny chipmunk jumps out onto the road and dares my father to drive past. And so the audacity of that character just killed my dad. He fell out of the car laughing hysterically. He was not wondering grasshoppers anymore. It was now the chipmunks. And that character, that chipmunk became Alvin. You know that in the face of whatever, Here's Alvin. Watch it, genius. We're chipmunks. Chipmunks. There were three record executives that my dad was signed to Liberty Records at the time, and Alvin or Al Bennett was the president, Simon or Cy Warrenker, that became Simon, and Theodore, Ted Keep was the head engineer over there. So the voices came from those three record guys. And personality-wise, Simon, of course, was the studious one with glasses, and Theodore was the giggler, overweight kid who loved to eat. So he never really filled those relationships and those personalities out like he did with Alvin. It was definitely the David Seville and Alvin show. Alvin! Did you call me? To hear Alvin talk back to my dad was thrilling for, for the three kids. Uh, so we loved it and we loved the interplay. And, and my dad made Alvin sound so real. Not only did he play the voice of David Seville, of course, but my dad also was the voices of all three chipmunks, including Alvin. So in essence, he's yelling at himself. Alvin? Alvin? Woo! He kicked that hamster wheel's butt. In 1958, the tradition was that you never played a Christmas song before December something or other. So my dad is late October, early November, trying to get the chipmunk song on the air. And nothing is happening because everyone's got tradition. Finally, my dad gets a guy to listen to it, and he loves it, and he puts it on. And of course, it was the proverbial lighting up of the switchboard, not unlike, you know, Christmas tree lights. So everyone wants to he get this song. And the fun thing about it was that it sold four and a half million records in seven weeks. It was an unheard of thing. It's the fastest selling song in the history of the music business to that date, and it didn't become eclipsed until five, six years later when the Beatles stormed in the United States. It was an overnight sensation and just, just a huge, huge thing. Speed of business, baby. That's how we do it. That's how I roll. <laughs> a couple of years later, he had the TV show, The Alvin Show, on CBS primetime back in those days, and of course, a whole cottage industry of all the various licensing. He certainly wasn't the first one to do that, but he did it in a way that was huge for the characters. There were even front page articles about what my dad was doing in terms of a, a cottage industry for Alvin and the Chipmunks. <sighs> this is not happening. 
I am not talking to chipmunks. I am not talking to chipmunks. So, how's that working for you, Dave? My dad was like the Armenian version of Zorba the Greek. You felt he was going to live to be 8,000 years old. So when he passed away, that was like an episode of the Twilight Zone for me. This cannot be happening. For me, a way of still having my dad around was to resurrect Alvin and the Chipmunks. I thought, well, this, this won't be hard. Everyone's loved them growing up. They're great characters. I'll bring them back again, and it wouldn't take but a year or so. So, like Fuller Brush people, we had brochures made, we went to the toy fair, we got the door slammed in our faces. A disc jockey in Philadelphia at about 2 or 3 in the morning, this is now 1980, plays Blondie's Call Me but speeds it up so it sounds like the chipmunks and facetiously announces it to about seven people or whoever is up at three or four in the morning as the latest song from the chipmunks. Well, like in 1958, the phones of the radio station are deluged. Oh my gosh, we've been waiting for this. Where do we get this record? And of course, it doesn't exist. So people uh, from back east call Janice and me, uh, listen, would you guys be interested in doing a new album? And, you know, we didn't even have the good sense to give it a pause for us. You bet we would! We jumped and probably were way too eager. <laughs> so, a couple of months later, Chipmunk Punk comes out, and as the Chipmunks sprang from zero to 60, full speed ahead back in 1958, here it was in 1980, sold a million and a half records before you knew what happened. I loved the design of the 60s, but I thought they were very 60s. I thought they were very stylized, so I thought we should bring them and update them to the 80s. I wanted to make sure that the relationship that Ross Sr. created with Alvin was as real with us as it was with him. And I also wanted to make more out of Theodore and Simon, because in Saturday morning you can do more. It was such a great opportunity to be able to create stories that young, malleable minds were watching, and that perhaps you could impart good messages that could maybe get through to kids watching the show. That was important to us. Alvin, I owe you an apology. That was a wonderful thing you did for Tommy. We were on Saturday morning from 83 to 91. And what kept us going is that we would get fan mail from kids. And when we first started, we were getting fan mail for Alvin and Theodore. And I, like a guilty mother, said to Ross, we're not getting any fan mail for Simon. And we have to write some shows for Simon because no one's paying him any attention. <laughs> so we started writing shows for Simon, and we wrote a, a show about Simon, and it was about the perfect child, where Dave has to give his attention to the baby, he has to give his attention to the troublemaker, Alvin, but he doesn't have to give his attention to Simon because Simon's okay. He can rely on Simon. Simon's gonna do the right thing. So we got tons of fan mail for Simon after this from kids who related to Simon. And when I realized that we were having that kind of impact and that kind of voice, and we were giving kids characters they could relate to, that's what kept us going. Keeping them alive, keeping them current and viable is, uh, is a full-time job. Idea, ding, 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 ding. Who has cab fare? Cab fare? We don't even have pockets. We didn't want to make a movie that was just for four-year-olds or for five-year-olds. We, we wanted that group who'd grown up with them in the 80s and 90s who were now in their 20s to have something that was smart enough, sassy enough, and fun enough for them not only to recognize the characters from their childhood, but to still be able to enjoy them. That ought to keep them awake. Janice and I also wanted to put, you know, little sprinkles of my dad in the film. 
So when you come to the David Seville house in the movie, you'll see his address above the door is 1958 when my dad created the chipmunks. When Jason Lee, who plays David Seville in the movie, is teaching the chipmunks the chipmunk song, he's playing that on my dad's piano that my dad did the song on. It's so important to us that this film is something that Ross Senior would be proud of. I need something new. I need something fresh. That, that, that I need is the next new. big thing. Hopefully where the chipmunks are going to be 10 years or 800 years from now is still doing something new because the personalities, who they are, and the relationships are timeless, but presenting them in a fresh new way is, is what's exciting for us to do. Dave, they're chipmunks who talk. People will come. Mm.